Uh, I was just telling them when we met a little earlier, why this uh, youth and truth? Literally incessantly in these last many years that I've been out meeting people and doing the work that we are doing, thousands and thousands of people have asked me this same question. Sadhguru, where were you twenty-five years ago? Where were you when I was twenty-five? <laughs> Why did you come so late? If you had met me when I was twenty, I would have done this, this and this, but you came so late. So I thought we will step out and meet all those people in the country who are below twenty-five years of age. And here we are <laughs> So, essentially, life means a certain amount of time and energy. This is what we call as life. And fortunately, most people forget this. Oh, this person has covered his face completely. There's something… Oh, that's <laughs> impressive, I didn't notice you <laughs> uh, The videos will be out soon, so don't worry <laughs> So, essentially, life is certain combination of time and energy. Time is slipping away for all of us at the same pace, which most people don't realize when they're young. And energy is at its best when you're youthful, which also most youth don't realize, they think they're going to be like this forever. It's not so, energies will deplete and go down. So when energies are at your peak and time is anyway running out for everybody, if only if we can bring little more clarity and balance to that life that we call as youth, I think tremendous things can happen. Above all, Every human being carries a certain genius within himself or herself. How many people manage to find the necessary balance and atmosphere for themselves where this genius will unfold? Unfortunately, that percentage is extremely minuscule right now. This is an effort to increase that percentage because if you bring the right atmosphere within yourself, once genius will unfold. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, it's not an issue. But in our lives, if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. If our own potential doesn't unfold, we will end up as a life who did not do what we could have done. So this is just an attempt, and India being a youthful nation, unless we create a focused, balanced, inspired youth. We could be a miracle if we do that. If we leave youth unfocused, imbalanced, uninspired, we have a recipe for a disaster. So, we thought we will reach out to you, so you can ask whatever kind of questions. Namaskaram Sadhguruji, it gives me immense pleasure on behalf of the entire IMB community to welcome you here. Thank you so much for taking the time out, sir. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, pleasure for me to uh, welcome Sadhguruji here. Sadhguruji, ever since that we know that you are coming here, so we've… Uh, our uh, forms have been floated with a lot of questions. <laughs> we have selected the but top… But why are you… why are you dressed like a bridegroom? <laughs> I, I, I have a question for that. I have a question for that. I have a Is question for that. Is there something coming up today? Hopefully, yes. So, sir, it gives me immense pleasure, sir. Uh, so, we uh, have a plethora of questions that we had. It's taken a lot of time to figure out the best questions. So, so, without wasting any time, let's get started, guys. So, Sadhguruji, one of the most trending questions that we have here on campus is FOMO, the fear of missing out. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we have the fear of missing out on activities, we have the fear of missing out on our placements, we have the fear of missing out on anything whatsoever under the roof. So, Sadhguruji, I have a question for you here, is when do we realize that it's the end, we have to stop this and this should not influence our decision making? I think a lot of our uh, community would resonate to this question and we want your perspective on this, sir. See, uh, fear of missing out. Let's uh, look at life a little beyond uh, your… your stay in the educational institution is only a transition, hmm? only to equip yourself for something you have come. 
you have not come to an educational institution as a destination. It's a packaging place to package you nicely so that you can <laughs> You package pretty well today, no? Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, <clears throat> not making a commentary on education, but how we go through it, about missing out, the fear of missing out. First of all, fear, let's address fear before we address missing out. Fear is always about what may happen or may not happen, right? Fear is not about what is… what we are experiencing right now. What will happen is always the fear. Or in other words, your fear is about something which is not yet. Your fear is about something which does not exist. This is all management people. If there were a few… somebody from a psychiatry department, you could have asked them, if I have fear about something that does not exist, what is my condition? They would have a title for you <laughs> Yes, Nimhans is close by, I think <laughs> We can always consult, that is also a premier institution. <laughs> we are suffering something which doesn't even exist. Yes? If you're suffering something that doesn't even exist, it is not about life, it is not about education, it's not about career, it is just about your mind being out of control. Is that not an important aspect that you should manage first before we allow you to manage an industry or a business? Is it not important first of all you learn to at least manage your mind? Hello? Isn't it important? If you do not know how to manage your mind, what the hell are you going to manage in the world? Managers are all freaking out and growing ulcers in their stomachs. Yes, today it's become normal. If you are a CEO by forty-five, if you don't have an ulcer, you are not a great CEO <laughs> Because you are managing by accident like this. The fear comes because there is an accidental possibility, isn't it? Tell me, let's say you don't know how to ride a bicycle. You sat on it, it was on stand, you were just pedaling for fun and it came off stand and started rolling. Anxiety or no? Started rolling faster, fear or no? Very fast, terror or no? It's not because bicycle produces terror. It is just that you don't know how to ride. If you know how to ride, faster it goes, the better it is. Hmm? Isn't it? Faster it goes, the better it is. The very, very uh, basis why we created a bicycle is because we wanted to go, go faster than walking. That's the idea. But if you do not know how to ride, how much fear it creates. Right now your problem is not with the world, your problem is not with your education. Your problem is your education system, right from kindergarten, hasn't told you a damn thing about how to manage yourself. They think you're going to manage the world without knowing how to manage yourself. When you are a mess, you can only create a mess, isn't it? You may be successful. Success happens for variety of reasons, you know? Success is not always hundred percent yours. There are situations, there are times which support us in many different ways. Of course, your bit is there, but just because somebody is successful, this doesn't mean they've figured out everything. This doesn't mean they are at ease with life, this doesn't mean their life is in some way fulfilled, no. Because today our idea of success is just doing little better than somebody else. You doing little better than somebody else means, and you are very happy about that, what it means is you are actually enjoying other people's failures. If somebody enjoys another person's failure, I call that sickness, not success. What do you call it? Hello? <laughs> I enjoy that you failed. This is sickness. This is not success, isn't it? Unfortunately, this is how you are going. This is the reason why human potential is not unleashed. 
Because if you are racing with a lame person, you are just happy you are one step ahead of him. Only when you meet Mr. Bold, you understand who the hell you are. Yes? Till then you think you are a great runner because other person doesn't have legs. <laughs> so it's very important that there is nothing to miss out in life. Life is happening to all of us. Hmm? Question is only, if I miss this party, am I missing out something? If I miss this examination, I am missing out something. If I miss this job, am I missing out something? This is simply because right now, who you are is not internally managed. It is externally stimulated. <laughs> you… you are still in a very controlled campus, a very beautiful campus you have, I have to say, wonderful campus. And uh, <laughs> you are in a very controlled campus atmosphere. When you step out into the world, if you leave it to the people to decide what happens within you, they are going to drive you crazy in no time. Here it's all managed for you, you're not managing this. It's managed for you, what should happen to you, what should not happen to you, somebody else is managing it. When you step out on the street, if you leave it to other people's hands that they can decide whether you're happy or unhappy, you're going to be miserable for sure <laughs> because they're going to do many things. <laughs> what happens within you must be determined by you, isn't it? Hmm? And anyway, why are you copying people? Most people don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> this happened. Shankar and Pillai joined Pentagon. He was working in Pentagon. Then he kept moving his work table from one office to another office, another office to another office. He went on moving around. Then he moved to the corridor, he moved into the garden, he moved here, there. Then he moved into the men's restroom and settled down there and started working. Everybody was looking at this, what's wrong with him, some problem? Initially they thought he's a Russian agent, then… <laughs> then he thought he must be a Muslim terrorist. Then they thought all those things, then everything ran out, he didn't cause any harm to anybody. Then he settled down in the men's restroom and started working. So they told the Pentagon's psychiatrist, that this guy's gone loony, he's working in the men's room and he settled down and he's just doing his work there. So the psychiatrist just strolled in as if he wanted to use the men's room and started chatting. Then he found he was quite normal, everything was fine with him. He said, why are you sitting in the men's room and working? He said, I moved everywhere and saw, I, in the end I find this is the only damn place where people know what they're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguruji. Uh, my next question is, uh, we've all seen the movie Three Idiots and there is one dialogue I think that's… What happened to the remaining idiots? They left them here <laughs> <laughs> So there is one dialogue in the movie that <coughs> sort of resonates with a lot of us and it says, when friend fail, it's sad, but when a friend pass or top, it's more sad. And… Uh, <laughs> and Building on to how you're affected by what people do, is it… Uh, my question is, is it okay to have that feeling? And if not, how do you let go of that feeling in today's environment? See, uh, you, you know Charles Darwin, you heard of Charles Darwin? There's something called as evolution. And nobody told you it's all complete. Today, some of the neuroscientists are saying, the DNA difference between a chimpanzee and you is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? <laughs> huh? So there is an evolutionary issue. If you don't take charge of yourself, very easily you will step back 1.23 percent. <laughs> now, if… Uh, what is that? I, I can't repeat that sentence, but anyway, if your friend uh, is… Uh, doesn't not do well, you'll feel sad about it. If he does very well, you'll feel very sad about it. <laughs> so you have fixed yourself in such a way, whichever way you cannot be happy. <laughs> you… you are in a self-defeating mode, no matter what happens, you will not be happy. 
if you want to understand what I'm saying, you go and stand out on one of the main streets in Bangalore city. Leave the poor people who are uh, selling kadlekai on the street side, leave them. People who are driving there, only look at those uh, BMWs, Mercedes and Maseratis and whatever is going around in Bangalore city, only look at the dream cars, okay? Because many of you may have dreams also of this. Just look at all these people, you think they are in a profusion of joy driving this car like that? No, only in case it's a stolen car, you see the joy <laughs> Otherwise, uh, no. So success has not brought joy, brought joy to them. If they're failed, of course they're frustrated. Because the very mode of approach is like this, if this mode of approach comes, whichever way it's not going to work, because it's not even about you, it's always about somebody here, it's never about you. The simple thing is this, see, if your joy, your sadness, your happiness, your misery is determined by something or somebody around you, the chances of you being joyful in your life is remote, yes or no? Is it true that human experience is created from within? Hello? Hello? I'm asking all of you. Is it true that human experience, joy or misery, agony or ecstasy, madness or sanity, everything is created from inside? Yes. At least if you're a manager, if you're going to be a manager, at least what is happening from within you must happen your way. Because essentially management means having situations the way we want it. Yes? Management means what? Having situations the way we want it. Well, if the world is not happening your way, at least this one must be happening your way, otherwise what kind of management is this? Here there's only one person, huh? Here there are thousand people, they may not listen to you, they got their own stuff. But here there's only one person, at least here what you want must happen, isn't it? If what you want happened, would you keep yourself blissed out or miserable? What's your choice? You must choose, I'm going to bless you now <laughs> If you had a choice, would you be rather be blissed out or miserable? Huh? Blissed out, of course. So if such a thing is not happening, then all these problems come. If things work, it is a problem. If they don't work, it's a problem. If you get a seat in this institution, it's a problem. If you cannot get out of this, it's a problem <laughs> You like this place so much, you don't mind staying here, it's not like that. You must get in and you must get out ahead of others, everything. It's never about you, it's always about something else. Outside is a variable situation. Who these people are today, tomorrow we don't know what they will say, yes? Tomorrow morning we don't know what they will say. If your way of being is determined by all these people, then you are a mess, you're bound to be a mess. When you're a mess like that, see, you call yourself a friend. If they fail, you're unhappy. If they pass, you're very unhappy. Definitely we should not use the word friend in this context. Yes, competition. I agree, not a friend, isn't it? If your friend does well, shouldn't you be very happy if they're really friendship? <laughs> Leave the friendship business. Essentially, this problem is coming because we have not taken charge of this fundamental human mechanism. This is not happening the way you want it. Is it true that your body right now is the greatest chemical factory on the planet? It is so. It is the most complex and sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. The question is only are you a great CEO or a lousy CEO? <laughs> because if you're a great CEO, you would create chemistry of bliss. If you're a lousy CEO, all these things will happen. Your industry should run the way you want it, isn't it? At least this one little industry <laughs> So, most of us here at IM Bangalore have been consistent achievers, at least in some domain or the other, for all our lives. 
but some time at i am bangalore is good enough to make you feel that you are not good enough so how do you deal with the pressure of being relatively average it's best somebody makes you feel that right here because anyway that may happen in your life it can happen in your work it can happen in your family somebody will tell you you're not good enough <laughs> So whether they tell you or not, I want you to understand, none of us are ever really good enough. If you have a large-scale intention in the world, you are never really good enough. People keep telling me, Sadhguru, you've done so many things, this project, that project. I'll tell you my project, because yes, the day before yesterday I was the Chamundi Hill. This happened thirty-seven years ago. I went up Chamund Hill and sat there for no reason. I was overflowing with ecstasy, every cell in my body exploding. I didn't know what was happening. When I spoke to my closest friends, they said, tell me what did you drink, what did you pop? This is the only thing they could ask. When I asked my own skeptical mind, my mind said, maybe you're going off the rocker. But I knew. I've hit a gold mine. Something fantastic is happening within me without any reason. If I simply sit like this, I become so ecstatic. What I think is two minutes have gone into seven, eight hours. Have you noticed this? When you're very happy, time just poof. So if I close my eyes and open, it's like eight, ten hours are gone, like that. So at that time, I just planned. This is my plan. This is fantastic. If I simply sit here, I'm completely blissed out. Then I decided, at that time, the world's population was some 5.6 five, 5 billion people. I said, in two and a half years' time, I'm going to… I made a plan, a specific plan, how I will do it. In two and a half years' time, I'm going to have the entire world blissed out because it doesn't take anything. If you simply sit here, it happens. Well, thirty-seven years, <laughs> Well, we might have touched uh, maybe on five hundred, six hundred million people on the planet, but that's not my idea of the world. My idea of the world today is seven point six billion people. So I know I will die a failure, hundred percent. And everything else that I wish to do, I know I will not even fulfill probably ten, fifteen percent of what I want to do. But I will die blissfully, because I'm living blissfully and I will die blissfully. So it's best that you're a failure in your life, that means your vision is large. If you're a success, you have a constipated sense of life <laughs> Success means what? I made it. What did you make? I bought a house site. You would think that's an achievement. I got a job. I made this much money. This is a very constipated way of looking at life. I want young people to look at it in terms of how we can do something that cannot be done in this lifetime. Oh, what will happen if I don't fulfill it? If you… if you work incessantly and still at the end of your life the job is not done, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you had a great vision, <laughs> that's what it means. May you die as a failure, is that okay? Yeah, you should, blissed out failure, that means you're doing great, not a miserable success. <clears throat> People are not liking it, I think. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to clap. I, I just thought maybe those words are little… Scary failure. <laughs> uh, Satmuji, my next question is, uh, today, unfortunately, we're all living in a very stressful environment and with… Really? <laughs> I think it's air-conditioned, everything is fine. <laughs> Little more uh, cooling would be nice, but it's not stressful. <laughs> Some people perceive it to be, I'll be praised. <laughs> Some people perceive it to be stressful and uh, you at times feel a little anxious or you feel depressed, but most often uh, I think the first battle is within yourself to identify that 
And in that scenario, how do you reach out and not feel vulnerable about it, that you are stressed and <coughs> So stress is not about any situation or atmosphere. Stress is your in inability to handle your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own chemistry, your own energy. Stress is not about the situation. One situation that somebody thinks is stressful, another person is breezing through that situation. Is it not happening? You see bad drivers are going like this, cursing everybody. You'll see a young boy, boom, he just goes off. He's not stressful, he's very happy for the, all the obstacles that are there in Bangalore city. <laughs> yes or no? So stress is not a consequence of situations. Stress is a consequence of your inability to manage your own thought and emotion. Your thought and emotion must happen the way you want it, isn't it so? If this one thing happened, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Hundred percent, isn't it? So instead of doing that, you're trying to manage the entire world the way you want it. It's never going to happen. Never ever going to happen. Even if you are a family of two, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yes? Most of you are not married <laughs> I'm saying even if it's just two people at home, it will never happen hundred percent your way, unless you're living with a dead person. Fifty-one percent if it happens your way, you have the controlling stake, you must be happy. Hundred percent, nobody will live with you, isn't it? Nobody will work for you, nobody will live with you, nobody will be around you if you insist hundred percent my way. I am glad the world is not happening your way, because if everything happened your way, where will I go? <laughs> little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way, eh, this is how the world should be. But this one must happen my way. There's no other way for this one. This one must happen my way. If this one person happened your way, do you think you'll be stressful? <laughs> Sir, so now I have a very trending question that everyone wants your perspective on. Sir, how do you know that the person you are with is the right person for you? <laughs> Whoa, popular, eh? Huh? It was in the top of the lot. Can I tell you a joke? Can I tell you a joke? Sure, because you're in the clothing. <laughs> I, I, that is why I'm said like this. That is why I'm said like this. It's good you asked the question before the event. <laughs> It once happened, Shankaran Pillai was at the family dinner and uh, when everybody settled down for dinner, he stood up at the table and announced, I am going to marry Lucy who is just across the street. I hope that's not the name. No, oh. <laughs> Then. The father said, what? you going to marry Lucy? She has nothing, she's like a tramp. You're going to marry that Lucy? Mother said, what? You're going to marry that Lucy? She has no inheritance, she has no family. The uncle, uncle's always pitching in these kind of matters, you know. <laughs> uncle said, what? You're going to marry that Lucy? Have you seen her hair? It looks fake. The aunt, what, you're going to marry Lucy? She's… she's always painted. You're going to marry the painted woman? The little boy, the nephew can't be left out. He said, you're going to marry Lucy? She doesn't even know what is cricket. How can you marry her? Shankaran Pillai stood his ground and said, yes, I'm going to marry Lucy. Everybody asked in one voice, why? He said, because she has no family <coughs> There are no many opinions to battle with <laughs> So, who is the right person? I, I don't want to take away all the romance from your life <laughs> But, let me tell you this, there is no right person on this planet. If you put your heart into something, something may become wonderful. 
Is it the right thing? There's no right thing. Nobody ever found the right person anywhere, okay? If you get into that kind of unrealistic mindset, I have found the right person, oh, you will be soon disappointed. <laughs> you must understand, there is no right person. First thing is to see whether I am the right person. Yes, am I the right person? Instead of seeing, is this the right person? Am I the right person, first of all? And there are no right people on this planet. If you understand, you have your nonsense, they have their nonsense. We can adjust nonsense to nonsense. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> we must understand relationships are formed for various needs. There are physical needs, there are psychological needs, there are emotional needs, there may be social needs, there may be financial needs, various kinds of needs. So when you are going to somebody with so many needs, you are going as a beggar and a beggar cannot choose. Hello? Beggar eat what comes its way, isn't it? He cannot choose. So if you really want to make a choice in this world, first and foremost thing is, you bring yourself to your place. I'm again going back to the same thing, where your experience of life is just pleasant by yourself. You're wonderful. Now, let us see what gets drawn to this one. If you're really wonderful, things will happen in every way, I'm saying. In terms of career, in terms of marriage, in terms of relationships, the best will happen to you because you made yourself like this. Instead of trying to work on somebody and fix them, if you work upon yourself and make you so wonderful that everybody wants to be with you, then there is a choice. Right now, when you're going out of your compulsive needs, you are a beggar. Beggars should not choose, they must eat what comes their way. And this whole thing is an American thing, that there is a soulmate somewhere. God made just one more person just for you. But these days, every two years, he keeps making one more person <laughs> just for you. <laughs> Obviously, God is making too many mistakes with you <laughs> Now, this soulmate business, first of all, I don't like to use that word, but now we have… you uttered the word. See, body needs a mate, understandable. Maybe psychologically also you need a mate, understandable. Emotionally you need a mate. A soul cannot need a mate. Even if your soul needs a mate, it needs evolution, isn't it? So soul doesn't need a mate, nor was some person made perfectly for you, okay? This creation makes uh, all kinds of unique idiots. If you understand you are one kind of idiot and the others are different kind, you will be… you will understand their nonsense because you know you got your stuff. If you think you're perfect and God has chosen you and he's made another person perfect somewhere else, you're heading for a disaster, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's no such thing. Even, uh, you know, people today, after five thousand years, people are still audulating and worshipping Krishna as the greatest lover, but his wives are dead unhappy with the guy <laughs> Yes. So, you're not going to find any perfect person. If you invest a deep sense of involvement, something wonderful may happen. It's because of your involvement, not because the other person is fantastic, no. Even if you choose a fool, actually it's easy that way. If they're not stupid, why would they come to you first of all? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I'm just being nasty. <laughs> So, even if you choose a fool, it doesn't matter. If you involve yourself, it can turn out very beautiful. You chose the smartest person in the universe, it could be a disaster. So, do not think in terms of, uh, you know, whatever this made for each other nonsense. No. You choose the opposite, actually. The genders are opposites. You choose the opposite because you don't want them exactly like you, you want them some other way. 
The reason why a ball is, boy is attracted to a girl and a girl to a boy is because they're different. But after some time, after a little bit of time, you slowly start expecting they're just like you. This is a serious mistake. Because if one more person becomes just like you, you won't be able to bear with them for two days. Hello? Please tell me. <laughs> There's one more person just like you at home, could you live there? You're glad they are different. It's wonderful, nobody is like you, isn't it? Nobody is like you on this planet. Try and see, nobody is like you and that's good. Don't look for sameness, not necessary. It's a difference which makes the… because of the difference you tango, not otherwise <laughs> So, Guruji, then in that case when we… Uh, uh, what I understand is then we should not find similarities of ourselves to someone else. Then why do we have role models? Role models? People keep asking me, Sadhguru, who is your role model? I tell them I don't roll with the models <laughs> You… see all these things you're picking up from Western cultures, here we never created a role model. Just look back on this culture and see. This is about it, constantly striving to evolve yourself. Role model essentially means you planted a mango tree and a coconut tree together. Coconut tree went straight up and tall. Mango tree saw, oh, I need to be like him and chopped off all its own branches and left one like this. This is going to be a lousy mango tree. Yes? You don't need a role model. The thing is, we are trying to drive people, young people especially, with either carrot or stick. Offer them something, otherwise beat them a little bit. This is like being a circus monkey. You want the circus monkey to do tricks, you give it a banana, it will do trick and again it will sit like this. Again you have to hang another banana there, otherwise it won't do. Don't become like this, all of you especially, I see, uh, I'm not saying about this institution, across the world I've spoken in every business institution. I see it's become so unhealthy. Everybody is thinking, what will I get, what will I get, what will I get, what will I get? Very few people are thinking, what can I create? What the hell are you going to get at the end of your life anyway? Will either bury you or cremate you? That's all you will get? Which, do, which one do you prefer? <laughs> because sometimes you even get fired for that reason. It once happened, Shankaran Pillai got fired from his job. See, I'm just telling you because you're in a school right now, here they can't fire you generally, unless you do something totally wrong probably. But outside, you know, small things you can get fired. As market economy grows and multiplies, people can get fired just like that. Shankaran Pillai got fired just because he asked a simple question, smoking or non-smoking? Why for such a simple thing a man must be fired? But what he was supposed to ask is cremation or burial. So, what is it that you're going to get at the end of this life? You will get nothing. The only thing is, did you live an intense and involved life? That's all you have. What have you got? What have I got? What have you got? What have I got? This is rubbish. But this has got particularly into business schools, this has gotten big time. In the United States, business school, nobody is thinking of anything. What's your first salary? The previous batch, what did they get the first salary? I must get little more than that. This is all because everything has become goal-oriented. There's no significance for the process. You know, we have business events every November. I think some shots were there of Ratan Tata and others. All the major leaders, business leaders in the country have come. Every year we have two hundred CEOs who go through four and a half days of training called Insight. Last year, one of this, you know, somebody who was running a reasonably major mm, multinational company said, Sadhguru, we picked the best from the IIMs and IITs in the country. 
and we keep paying them more and more year after year. But you, you don't have single I am here. I said, I all have only school dropouts. But your organization runs better managed than our corporation. How's this? I said, see, this is all it is. You guys are goal-oriented. You want to get somewhere. Here, people who are working for me, they don't even know where to go. They don't even care where they go. All they know is they are absolutely devoted to the process. Right now, what they're doing? They're so absolutely devoted to it, everything that's there in them is coming out in that single action. This is all a human being can do. Either you're doing your best or not doing your best, isn't it? You may not be able to do as well as somebody, but the question is, are you doing your best in every moment of your life? For this, you need devotion. I'm specifically using the word devotion because devotion means people think going to the temple or church or mosque or whatever is their destination. No. You tell me, has anybody in any field of uh, activity, either sport, music, art, business, spirituality, politics, whatever, has anybody reached any significant states of achievement without being devoted to what they're doing? Have they? Has anybody gotten anywhere, I'm asking? Mediocre nonsense they've done, they maybe got more and more salary, but they did not do anything significant. So you have to decide whether you want to live a mediocre life or you want to live a, an intense, beautiful life. Because life is only in its experience, in not what you possess. Hmm? Life is only in the way you experience it, not in what you have. What you have will mock at you after some time. If your experience is not good, people can live in a palace and be terrible. People are committing suicides in palace, isn't it? So, what you possess is not at all the point. How you experience it, everything is the point, isn't it? But right now, the entire world has gone towards this direction. You young people must change this. The intensity of your experience is more important than the immensity of your possessions, isn't it? So one last question from our side is that, um, so as we enter a B school or any new sphere of our lives, we might have a vague idea or direction as to where we're headed. But the people around you might create an impression that yes, this is the place to be or this is the job that you should have or this is the car you should have. So it leads to a group think of sorts. So how do you decide what is the best for you and not get influenced by the externalities that we were discussing before and internalize all this? I'm asking you a simple question, all of you who are students here. Is your life, your life, I'm talking about your life, is it a precious life? Yes. I want you to understand this. Even a so-called insignificant ant, if you try to catch him, he shows how significant his life is for him. Yes or no? He doesn't think, I'm just an ant, you can crush me. No, his life is very precious for him and that's so for you. If your life is so precious, is it not important where you are going to invest this life? Hmm? You're going to invest this life simply because somebody's going to pay you a little more. You're going to invest your life simply because your friend is going to a lesser company and you're feeling very good about that. This is not the way. When such a question arises in your mind, you must withdraw from the influence of your peers, your parents, your teachers, the atmospheres that you normally live in, just a small amount of time, maybe five, ten days, where you're well supported so that you don't have to fight for survival. You are supported but you're not influenced to such a place and really look at this, where do I want to invest my life? Into what? What… what is it truly worthwhile for this life to be involved in for the rest of my life? When you are not unhappy, 
when you're not frustrated, when you're not jealous, when you're not hateful or resentful, when you're peaceful and happy, you must decide what you wish to do. Once you decide, you shouldn't be every day looking who is doing better, who is doing better, who is doing better. Nobody is doing better than anybody. Either you're doing great or you're just lousy, that's all there is. Yes, within yourself, in your experience of life, either you're doing great or you're having a lousy life, that's about it. Nobody is doing better than somebody, nobody is happier than somebody else. Either you're joyful or you're not, isn't it? So you must invest in your life what you think is truly worthwhile. It doesn't matter what it gives because, you know, in the end, do you know this, there is no cargo ship going with you? <laughs> Hello? There's no cargo ship going with you, so possessions are only for our use, not to accumulate. Yes, what we can use, we must have, of course. But it is not just to have something against somebody else, most people's ho houses are like warehouses. <laughs> They're living in warehouses because most of the stuff, at least seventy to eighty percent of the stuff in most homes are never used, they're just warehousing it. They have no space to move, they have to clean it every day, but lots of things they got because neighbors bought it. <laughs> it's time because this is sensible for your life and this is sensible for the planet. So, Sadhguruji, we also have a set of e-media questions mm -hmm. that have come to us. So, we would like to address the name of the person and the question that we've got. So, we have a question from Erin Hestrong. He… Uh, just to give a little bit of context, we saw the video of Sadhguruji running on Himalayas, playing football, playing cricket. So, sir, in that context, how to keep yourself on the go all the time? On the go? You don't have to be on the go all the time. If life demands, people ask me, Sadhguru, how are you active like this? Because generally my schedule is anywhere between eighteen to twenty hours a day, seven days of the week, three sixty-five days, non-stop. For many years it's going on. Bye, bye, bye. Hey, I'm… I'm complaining and the guy is clapping about it <laughs> So, people keep asking, how do you keep yourself like this, how do you do this? See, I'm essentially lazy. It's just that the situation in the world demands action. Left to myself, I would close my eyes and simply sit. I'm made like this, if I close my eyes, I can sit like this till I fall dead. Really, I have really no need for action, I'm not trying to keep myself busy. There's a lot to be done, so you're doing. People ask me, Sadhguru, what's your dream? What is your dream? I said, my dream is the day I'm unemployed, that's a great day. Because if I'm unemployed, it simply means everybody is doing fantastic. What more do you want? Dream fulfilled? <laughs> so, action is not something that you decide. You just decide your intent. Action. The world will decide how much of what. I… I'm, you know, at these economic forums and stuff, I'm at the Ec World Economic Forum. This guy from one of the business schools in Harvard Business School, one professor comes, Oh, you're that amazing tree planter? I said, No, I'm not a tree planter. <laughs> he said, No, no, you planted those millions of trees. Yes, I did, but I'm not a tree planter. <laughs> Ask me. Then what do you do? I said, uh, I make people flower, not plant trees, but I'm planting trees because the goddamn trees are missing where they should have been. <laughs> where they should have been, they're not there. It's like this. Two men were working on the street. One man is digging pits, behind him another man is coming and closing and closing and going. Somebody else was driving by, they saw this ridiculous activity, one guy digs the pit, another guy closes the pit. So they stopped and said, hey, what are you doing here? Why are you guys working like this? One guy digging, another guy closing. They said, no, no, uh, the in-between guy has gone and leave. He's the tree planter. <laughs> He's not there, we're doing our work. So a lot of people are doing work like this. I'm doing my work. You have no work on this planet. 
If the planet needs work, if the world needs work, we will do it. Otherwise, why should I think this is my work? Sadhguru, what's your mission? He said, no mission, I'm just fooling around a bit <laughs> because you have no business to have your own mission. Life has its own mission. In some way, if you can assist and serve that, that's about it. What is it that you have your own mission? Are you some kind of a tyrant? All missionaries are tyrants in some way, unknowingly. Yes, those who think they have a mission, there is no mission. What is needed, you do, especially when you study in a business school and get certain competence to manage things or create things. You must create what is needed, not create some rubbish and push it on them. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. You must see how to make life better, how to solve situations which are problematic to a whole lot of people. You must look for solutions and solutions for the existing situations. And of course, there are experts who go on creating new problems. So you will never be short of problems, believe me. You just have to create solutions not go on a mission mode. <laughs> That's for Mussolini. Uh, Sadhguruji, Shilpa wants to know, I think, and we've been discussing this uh, for a long time, that you shouldn't set a goal, you should enjoy the process. Uh, but how do you be less goal-oriented in life and follow your passions? And also, is… aren't her passions also a goal? <laughs> See, less goal-oriented goal, goal means what? Have a goal and not get there? Or have a small goal? What is it? Less goal-oriented. See, what you're calling as a goal is a consequence, isn't it? If you're only focused on the consequence and not on the process, then your consequence will just be an unfulfilled dream in your life, just a desire which will be unfulfilled. Only if you conduct this process right, consequence will happen. Maybe not necessarily that you… the way you thought, maybe it'll happen in some other way. But the consequence is bound to happen, isn't it? If you're conducting the process right, it's like uh, growing flowers in your garden. If you want flowers in your garden, you don't have to do flower meditation. You don't even have to think of flower. Probably you don't even know what flower will come out. But you need to think soil, manure, water, sunlight. None of them look or feel or smell like flowers. But if you handle them right, flowers will happen. This is how life works, this is life's process. If you do not engage in the life's process, if you do not figure out what is the life's process, then you will only desire. Desires are very exhilarating to have in the beginning. Later on, that's what makes people frustrated. If you just look at people's faces, I'm not making any commentary on any people here, I'm saying just look at people's faces in the world. Look at your own face when you are five years of age. Your face was like this. Slowly becomes like this. After this event, <laughs> get a little more and more sober. Slowly, the way people are walking, I'm afraid they may scratch their chin on the floor. It's becoming so long. I was addressing a group of people at the Princeton University. I just looked around, there were about three and fifty, four hundred people, all of them. <laughs> Especially in the universities, they have extra long faces. <laughs> Maybe it's a weight of knowledge. I just looked around, only about four or five young people who were sitting there, they were little lively, all others like this. If I tell them a joke, they agree with me <laughs> Then after about forty, forty-five minutes of talking, then I say, what's happened to all these people over thirty years of age? Why are they carrying such long faces? One lady stood up and said, they're all married <laughs>